Okay, we're continuing in Sefer Shoftim. We're on Parag Vav, Pasuk Lamed Gimel. So Gidon has uh, did this sign to know that Hashem will be with him, and he um, the uh, he put his offering there, and the Malach consumed the whole thing, and then. Uh, it was that night Hashem told him to uh, build, uh, to destroy the, all the idol worshipping things that were in his house and to, bring, uh, his, uh, and to bring that as an offering and totally destroy it. He took ten men and did this. People found out the next day and the people wanted to kill him and then we explained the Machlokas as to whether the father said we should kill him or not kill him. But be that as it may, the, the morning came up and Gidon remained, the idols did not do anything to him, and he was known as Yeru Baal. That's how we left it, because he was one who contended with the Baal. The Baal was the Avodah Zarah, or conversely, the prayer was let the, let the Baal contend with him, but he wasn't able to contend with him. Either way, it shows this contention that existed between uh, Gidon and those who followed the Baal. And he was the anti-Baal. That was clear. Okay. So now we're in Pasuk Lamed Gimel. So now that it's pretty clear that Gidon is a is, is courageous. He's against the Baal. He's shown that the Baal is false. Jews are still suffering greatly under the hands of the Midianites, the Amalekis, and the, and the Bnei Kedem. So now we continue with the with the, the political issues and the military issues. You see, what we have to first take care of the spiritual issues. And Gidon has uh, been empowered by Hashem and has shown his courage to be the servant of such a, a leadership. So now we get ready for the battle. Pasuk Lamed Gimel. Midian v'amolek b'nei kedem ne'es v'yachtov. And all of Midian, Amolek, and the b'nei kedem gathered together and they passed by and camped in the valley of Yisrael. Okay, so they're ready for war. Pasuk Lamedal, Veruach Hashem, Love Sha'es Gidon, and the spirit of Hashem enclosed Gidon. Vayiska Bashofer, he blew a shofar, Vayiso Eik of Yisra Acharov, and that his the family part of Menashe, which is Aviezer, they, they gathered, they gathered to the clarion call of the shofar that he blew to get them together. What does it mean for Ruach Hashem and the spirit of Hashem overcame Gidon? So the Metsudah David says that he, so he, he had a spirit from Hashem, a spirit of Gvura Ba'omatzalev, a spirit of courage came over him. The Malbam, on the other hand, explains that this Ruach Hashem is Ruach Gvur, uh, uh, says Ruach Gvur, as the Rambam says, and he says it's the Madrega Rishon of Nevoah, the first level of Nevoah. In other words, the lowest, lowest level of prophecy is that a spirit of Hashem comes over him. Uh, to save the nation. That itself is an aspect of Nebuah. Well, it's not anything like prophecy, the ultimate levels of prophecy, but the f- fact the person feels courageous and bold to do the will of Hashem, there's something internally cooking inside of him. So Rabbi says that's the lowest level of Nebuah. So he's gathering the, tr- the people around him to come with him. Vayom, uh, oops. That Uma Lamed Hey, so that the shofar. That it's interesting. There's no explanation that I see. Like all of a sudden, he's the leader. All of a sudden, he blows the shofar, and everybody's coming. You know, this is the uh, uh, the weakest of the tribes. So I don't know. Like like who was this Gidon that all of a sudden? You know, well, let's try to remember. I mean, he, he's from an idolatrous family. Many Jews were idolatrous. Okay, Hashem did. Uh, he, he did a courageous thing. All of a sudden, everybody uh, is, is following Gidon. Like, like where that comes from, there's something missing in between the lines over here. How he so quickly, uh, un- unless he was very prestigious beforehand. Uh, even though he says the family was the smallest family, the least important family. All of a sudden, he just blows the chauffeur. 
everybody from the truck okay, maybe from his tribal p- people from Avies okay they saw what happened with him and they were um, they were uh, influenced by what they saw but you'll see what happens in Lamed Hay now Umalachim Sholach B'chol Menashe he sends messengers throughout the entire tribe of Menashe Vayiza Eka Muach Rav and they also gather around him Umalachim Sholach Ba'asher Ubizbulun Bav Naftali and he sends messengers to the tribes of Asher Zulun Naftali Vayadul Likros and they all come towards him as well so it's like an instant gathering of all these people and we'll see the Mephorshim later on will tell us this didn't happen didn't take longer than a day so all the tribes in the north they all come together so it's interesting how, how all that happened so quickly so it's not not clear what the mechanics were to make that happen okay it's a question Lamed Vav by Yomer Gidom Elokim so now Gidom speaks to Hashem and again we keep seeing this over and over uh, after all that was said and done Hashem said get up go you'll fight and he says well let me just make sure I wasn't imagining this it's one thing then Hashem says now go and destroy their idols and their mispeach etc and he does that and nobody did anything to him over there so still he's nervous he's reluctant he says Im biyodi es kasher dibarta. if there will be salvation in my hand as you have spoken in, in other words uh, uh, if, if you have within you uh, that, that you want me to save the Jewish people so it gives them another test as it were to see and we'll see exactly what the nature of this test was but he creates this test again um, now again is, is he exactly speaking to Hashem is it happening through a Navi uh, again so Al Bag is consistent throughout all this Prakim that it's always a Navi talking to him it's not Hashem all the other forces seem to say it's Hashem so when it says by Yom Rekin and Elohim does it mean Hashem or is it referring to a Malach so Raul Bag says it's a Malach and throughout it's a Malach and uh, all the other Mephorshim tend to suggest he's talking to Hashem so now here comes the test so this is very tricky again how we learn the, this test over here I'm going to spread out a blanket of wool in the threshing house now imtal now that's going to be tonight if there will be in the next morning dew on this blanket of wool by itself but on the rest of the earth around it is dry I will know that you will save through my hand the Jewish people as you spoke okay Lamed Ches and so it was Gideon did this yeah Gideon Gideon says I'm going to put a blanket a, full, a woolen blanket in, in the threshing the threshing house was open it wasn't enclosed it was open it was a threshing area so the dew could go on it the question is what's going to look like the next morning so if there will be dew on the blanket alone and on the rest of the earth it is dry I will know that you are sending me to save the Jewish people Lamed says, Vayihichen, and it was so. Vayash came, Mimachras, he got up the next morning, Vayozer es Hegizo, and he, he comes to the blanket and he wrings out that woolen uh, blanket. Vayimetz Talmina Giza Miloha Seifel Moim, and he's able to squeeze out so much dew from that blanket, be able to fill up an entire pitcher. Lamed says, still not enough. If I yomer Gidon el Elohim, and Gidon says to Hashem, Al yichar apcha bi, please don't get angry at me. Fatab rak apam, I got to speak to you again. Anasa no rak apam, but Giza, I would like to make a test just this time with the Giza, with the blanket. Yehi no chorev ala Giza levar v'chorev siyatol. Now this time I'd like to see that the blanket, which yesterday was filled with dew, will be dry and the rest of the earth should have dew on it which is the exact opposite certainly between the two uh, mornings you'd know that something very godly is going on over here 
maybe you could figure for some reason there's more dew on the blanket the first day okay but now the second should be reversed that is incredible so Pasuk Mem Vayas Elohim came Hashem does that Balaylo on that night Vayichorav Alagizel of Adah there was only dry on the blanket alone Valkol Oretz Hayatol and on the rest of the earth there was dew now there's a few interesting um, differences in the Pesukim that will uh, tend to explain why the Malbum will explain us what, we, what we'll show in a moment in Lamed Ches the response to what he asked for was Vayehi Chein and it was so okay well in Pasuk Mem it doesn't say that it says Vayash Eloi Kim Kein Balai Lahu and Hashem did so on that night so uh, th- there's obviously something going on because why didn't it say that in Lamed Ches why, why aren't Lamed Ches and Mem consistent it says and it was so right now again if you look again in Lamed Ches what, what, what did he ask for in Lamed Zion he says that the whole earth the land should be dry right but there should again the but there should be dew no it's not just first that the dew should be on the blanket right. alone and the earth should be dry right so what does it say in Lamed Ches and it was so he gets up and he squeezes stuff out of the blanket what is not referred to we don't know anything about the earth it said it was dry. No, it didn't. Not in Pasuk Lama Ches. Yeah, but Vayihi Chayin. But that's uh, what he asked for. It, it, it just... Vayihi uh, and it was so. What was it? So he gets up in the morning. Now we get the description. And the description only describes the water, the dew that was on the wall. It doesn't say that the earth was dry. If, if, if it was so, everything is just said Vayihi Chayin. Finish the end of Pasuk. It was so. What was so? Well, he got up the next morning and he squeezed out the wool and he squeezed out a whole bucket full of water into the wool from the wool into the bucket anything mentioned about the earth? nothing Lama Tess Gidon says listen this time I want to reverse it I want to see if the Giza the wool will be dry and the earth will be filled with tal and in Mem it says Bayas Elohim Cain and Hashem did so Balai Lahu on that night and it says both there was dry on the Giza alone and on all, all the earth there was dew so it seems in the second test more was happening than on the first test ok you understand the, 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 the differences in the Pesukim over here which leads the Malvin to his following commentary and he, gets, he has a lot to say over here Okay, where are we going to start? Uh, first of all, the first question that all the commentaries ask is, since when do you ask God if he could do something? Yeah. So, you know, no. So, so, this, so, so, they, they, so they all say he didn't ask a, a sign to know if Hashem has the ability to save them. Because that you're not allowed to do, as many of them tell us. But when he saw, again, that the generation was not worthy for his salvation, he just he says you know what you don't win these wars if you don't deserve to win these wars you have to spiritually be on a level to win these wars and he you know was correctly analyzing the situation the Jewish people are not on a level to deserve this that's the problem speaks out ki who built roy lechua that maybe even if his people of his city left the Baal of his little part of the world but the, all the other tribes were bowing down to them uh, so, so that as we'll see later on the proof to that therefore he wanted another sign if his quote unquote small merit will be enough to bring this salvation he says I, 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 I no doubt you could do anything but I just you know you could be leading me to just get killed you know I just don't have enough confidence in the spiritual balance that's in the world that uh, is there enough spirituality on our side and, and it's not a lot right to be able to accomplish all this kind of victory so so that that is the, the the test he wants to make so the first test he they he suggests is mainly referring to what's going on with the wool as opposed to what's going on with the dry land 
So on the first test he says um, he, he, that there should, even though he uses the word that, uh, that the earth should be dry, he didn't mean it should be totally dry. Because there is a Chazal that says, uh, which he brings a little bit later on, he says there's no such thing as God not bringing Tal all the time. Dew is something that happens all the time. Every day there's dew. It's supposed to rain. Rain sometimes comes, sometimes doesn't come. But dew is something that has to always be. And we'll see in a minute what it's reflecting. So he never really asked that it should be, even though he said dry, he meant dry in comparison to how waterlogged the wool item would be. So the main thing was to see if the wool would be waterlogged. right? And he's saying the fact that dew comes down, but that's, that's pretty normal. And we'll see in a minute, it's pretty normal even that maybe more dew should stay on the wool than on the earth. Maybe the wool has the ability to retain the dew that was on it as opposed to a piece of dry land. Which we'll see in the second test when he says that the wool should be totally dry, right? And, and there's no wool on, on that. That's going to be an amazing thing. So he wanted two steps because there's two things he wanted to analyze. First he wanted to analyze was, was his merit alone enough to help the Jewish people even though they are idol worshippers? And therefore he said in Muhammad Vav, Im yeshka Moshiach biyadi. Will you bring a salvation through my hand, es Yisrael, the entire Jewish world? Will through my hand, my little amount of merit that I bring to the table, will it be able to save the entire Jewish people? And, 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 what, and why did he pick to, to put the wool in the Goren, in the threshing floor? Because that's where uh, the Malach appeared to him. So in other words, that's me, that's reflecting of me, and I'm this little piece of wool, right? So, so now what's the idea of the Tal in general? He says the whole symbolism of Tal is an analogy to the Shefa Elohim, the, the, the divine flow, the divine assistance that comes from above. That Hashem has always helped, and the, the prophet Hosea says, Eyek katal Yisrael, Hashem says, I will be like dew for the Jewish people. In other, words, that, in other words, the do is something that's always consistent. It always comes. In other words, Hashem, but, but you don't always see it. When, when does the do come? It comes at a funny time. You know, it depends how early you get up in the morning, if you'll see the do or not. Right? And when, is, when does the do mainly come? It comes in springtime. Right? Now remember, when's this story taking place? It's Pesach time. Right? What do we pray for? on the last day of Pesach on uh, the first day right, right? for Tal you're praying for Tal so no, there's a lot, lot going on over here so the idea of the, the whole idea of Tal is Hashem you know sometimes Hashem does rain is like you know he does outstanding things at, at unique times a thunderstorm whoa everybody knows when it's thunder and lightning and the rain is pouring then you're very much aware that Hashem helps right that's obvious the Tal is a much more subtle, quiet, doesn't make a lot of noise. It's there. It just somehow, somehow the atmosphere, just all of a sudden the plants get all this moisture on them. And that's very effective in helping them grow. doesn't make a lot of noise. And if you get up late in the morning, you aren't even going to know what happened. You know, when you get up early and you walk on the grass, your feet are, are waterlogged. But uh, you get up at 10 o'clock in the morning and the, and the sun's been shining on that for two, three hours, it's gone. So it's kind of showing the, the God's consistent help for the Jewish people, even though you don't necessarily see it all the time. Right? So he wanted to see, so, so this was the, uh, the symbolism of how much will Hashem be bestowing upon um, him and the Jewish people. So he's saying, so if the dew will be on this woolen thing alone, and everything else will be dry. In other words, means to say dry, meaning even the Jewish people who are really dry, they're not deservant of the fact that Hashem should bestow His blessings upon them with the dew. Right? The dew is symbolic of Hashem bestowing His help. So, 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 if, so if this woolen uh, cloth will be waterlogged that means Hashem will really be giving me a lot of help that I, that I will need and there will be enough divine assistance in spite of the fact 
that the Jewish people do not have it and they're pretty dry in their Torah and mitzvahs. Right? Then I'll know, Kitoshia Biyadi, as you saw, I will have enough merits to overcome the Jewish people. So now, what does it say? Lamelchesvai, he came. And it was so. Right? And, and, he, and, he, and he had to get up early, right? Because I guess you have to get up early to see the dew. Right? That's why it says, by Yashke he had, he had to get up early. If you get up late, you're not going to see the dew. So he gets up, and he sees on, on the Giza is waterlogged. But what happened about the earth? So he brings from the Chazal, doesn't tell us what happened that the earth was dry, because the Chazal say, Kibris Krusalatal Bal Yatsar. It's a covenant that there always will be due, and the due never stops. So what was the symbol, what was the, the mo face, what was the, the unusual thing, is that the wall was, had so much tal, as opposed to rest at a regular amount of tal. So that was pretty much within the normal, natural thing. It's not so unusual that the wool should have a lot more dew than the other one. So that itself really doesn't say a lot if you don't have the next day. Because this could just be regular. All right. So, but it does say, number one, he will be able to save the people. He will save them alone, even without the people, through a miraculous occurrence. Right? So now... He says, but so, so that's wonderful. But still, it's not 100% because maybe that's natural. I need something that's going to be the exact opposite the next day that will show me that this was really an unusual thing. Now, it's interesting. I guess he never bothered to look at the dew until now. I guess, I guess if you asked any uh, meteorologist or scientist, they could tell you right away what would happen the first day maybe. Okay. I guess he just never bothered to notice. So he says, well, let, let's try it a second time. Then now it should be the exact opposite, that the very same wool that was waterlogged should now be dry. Now that is already totally against nature. Because if anything, that should have more than anything else. Right? So that's what he wants to test next. And uh, so he wants to know, uh, he says, so on the, on the first one, so we knew that the, that, that the dew, you can't stop the dew going anywhere else. But he wanted to know, what would he have enough, in the first one, would he have enough to be able to, uh, even though everyone else is kind of dry. But, now what, but I want to know if this was really, the first day was really something special, because from the second day, when you see it doesn't happen. So that shouldn't happen at all. So, but, so now, and what does the second one teach him? He teaches him a second thing. The second thing is teaching him that even if the wool will be dry, there will still be towel on the rest of the earth. Mean to say that there'll be a time in this battle that you will fight where maybe you won't even be the one to help, but the Jews themselves will be able to help themselves. And that, that would show that, you know, as dry as you think they are, maybe they're not so dry. So that's very interesting. So it's like Gidon kind of felt, he knew the Jews were not good. And he kind of felt that they're, that they're dry people. And that's what he was wanting to see in the first test. You, you, you're trying to show me, well, is, am I going to have so much dew on, on me that's going to be enough to, to counterbalance the dryness of the Jewish people? See, so Taka sees a lot, but Hashem says, you know what, there's still dew on the Jewish people. You know, as, as bad as they are, deep down inside, they still, they still believe in me. They're not, there's no such thing as a totally dry Jew. There's always some towel on the earth. They're not, they're not so... And, 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 I'll, and I'll show you even more that even the next day, even there'll be a time when you'll be dry, and there'll still be something of them, and they'll still, they still have merits that they can tug on. And it could be that after what you do in the beginning, and your influence to them will be enough to promote their own growth as well. So, uh, so that's what that's the explanation there. Okay, is there anything else? Uh, no, that, that's fine. Okay, so that's pretty clear. So Hashem shows him this. So now he, he's ready to go. Okay, Pasuk Alf. Starting the next paragraph. Vayashkem Yerubal hu gidon v'cholom asher ito vayachanu al ein charod. So Yerubal who is gidon and all the people that are with him and they camp in a place called ein charod. Hu machan em midyan hoyolo mitzafom v'kivas hamorebo emek. And the camp of Midian was north of that. Uh, north from Givas Hamoreh, the, the hill of Moreh, 
but Amek in the valley. Again, it seems that the enemy tends to go to the valley for some reason, which is not so good for them. <laughs> so let's just take a look a little at the symbolism over here. Where are they camped? In a place called Ein Harod. And the enemy is in Givat Hamore. These are not just Stam names over here. Uh, we will see shortly in Pasa Gimel that uh, Gidon is going to have to make a test of the troops to see if they're battle worthy. And one of the tests are are there any people who are afraid? Anyone who's afraid? So the word that, for that is Choreid. Choreid, that would be the word in Pasa Gimel. Ein Charod is this area of Charod that has to do with the word, word fear. So it seems that the Jews are camping in an area that has to do with the word charod, has to do with fear. On the other hand, the enemy is in Givas Hamore, and the Targum explains on the word Givas Hamore, he calls it Migivato de Mistakhya. Mistakhya means uh, it's the hill of the scouts. The scouts. The scouts were able to look far ahead. So it's interesting. In Sefer Bamidbar, when Balak took Bilam to a high place to curse out the Jew, the Jews, he took a place called Stay Tsofim, and a, a, a field of Tsofim, and Targum also calls it a place to gaze, to look. So what, why was that? Because Bilam's whole power was to look at the Jewish people, and for what purpose? To find their weakness to find their flaws, to find where they sin. And why would he do that? Because he would evoke those flaws before Hashem. He, he, would, he would speak it out to Hashem. And that, as we mentioned earlier last week, we said and the whole purpose of Midian is, is, is Madan, to cause contention and separation. And their idea was to cause a separation between Hashem and the Jewish people. And that way he could destroy the Jewish people. That's the whole power of Midian. They're the lawyers, the spiritually negative lawyers of the world to bring out all the dirt and schmutz that exists. I mean, you see this happening in the world today. I mean, you, you know, never, uh, 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 the, the, the best golf, golfer in the world has some kind of accident in his, in his driveway, which doesn't involve anyone, and the whole media is just not leaving this guy alone. No, what, whatever he did, it's nobody's business, and everybody is like a midjourney. You know, the, 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 like the, the, why is Tiger not telling all? You know, like what's it your business? So let's say he got in a fight with his wife or whatever. What, you know, they, they say he wasn't drunk, so like let it go. He, he, whatever, he was a klutz. He was whatever. It, it doesn't matter. You know, it didn't involve me. Nobody filed a police report. And they just, so they're trying to create this tension. You know, trying to either say, look, he's not such a wonderful act. Like, what are you bringing this all up for? It's unbelievable. So that's what Midian does too. They try to find, well, what is the Jews who don't do so good and we're going to highlight Bilam. it? And, uh, what? But uh, Midian, Midian and Bilam, that, that he, Midian uh, hired him uh, for this to find, what are the Jews do wrong? Let's bring up the schmutz that we can and let Hashem see that schmutz and this will distance the Jews from them. So that's the power that they come from. That's why they're camping on, what do we say? Mikivat Hamoret, the place where you can get a good look at what's going on. Okay, I don't understand how you could do that from, from the valley, but anyway, be that as it may, that's what they call it. So now, how do you fight against that? Yeah. Yes, I don't understand. Yeah, a Giva is a hill, right? The hill of Mora that's in the valley. I don't, I don't understand. We have to know the topography. Anyway, so how do you fight against it? You fight against it, well, if they're gazing, they're gazing in a negative way, the only way you fight against it is by gazing in a positive way. Seeing things the way they really are, seeing things with a clarity, with a perspective of the right things. And there's only one type of gazing, and that's what? Yura Sashem. Fear of Hashem, because Yura comes word raw to see. See things the way Hashem wants you to see them. See them with the emis. That is the way you counteract that kind of vision. So that's why they're calling it Ein Charod, the place of fear, meaning to be Charod for Hashem, to fear Hashem. So we have Ein Charod is the antidote to give us Hamorah. And you'll see this is exactly what Gideon is going to do on this mountain, where he's going to weed out from a, from a troops of 32,000 troops. He's going to whittle it down to 300. 
And that's who's going to fight this, this, the, the enemies. And that's exactly what he's saying. I only want people who have real year session. In other words, they're looking, you know, it, it, it's not, nothing is as it appears. I don't think got these big armies. But you can imagine, these big armies, they're talking bad about the Jews. You don't think the enemies, the generals are, are, are telling them, don't worry about the Jews. Yeah, no, they all say, yeah, but they, they all know the Jews got, they got a God, you know. They got a very powerful God. How we, you know, there's always in the back of every Goyish nation is how are we going to attack these Jews? They got a powerful God. It says, ah, you don't have to worry. They're worshiping the Baal. They're doing this and they're doing that, doing all these things. They're not going to be able to win. And the more they say, you know, Hashem's listening. He said, yeah, yeah, that's right. If the Goyim feel the Jews aren't deserving of it, that's the biggest call of Hashem. When the Goyim say, the Goyim, they understand that. They're worshiping this, they're worshiping that. God's not going to help them. Hashem says, yep, yep, that's right, that's right. The worst thing, Chil Hashem, means that God's presence and i.e. the Jewish people's presence because that reflects God is minimized in the eyes of the world so the fact that non-Jews are talking that way that's an amazing Chil Hashem so, and so the truth is how do you win against that you can't win against that there's only one way you can win against it those troops got to be the ones that they're going to fight you can't touch these guys if, if the troops that are going to fight the Midianites it's as the Midianites say that, that they aren't such wonderful people then Hashem says, Taki, you're right, and, and, and they should win the battle. So what has to happen in the next couple of Sukkim is we've got to clean up the troops to the level that at least these troops that they fight against, there's nothing you can touch them with. And that's what has to happen over here. So let's continue in Pasuk Basis. We'll explain the unusual things that are going on now. Pasuk Basis. By Yomer Hashem al Gidon. Hashem says to Gidon. Now this time it's Hashem. Hashem is pushing the envelope over here. He says, Rav HaOma Sher Itoch. There's way too many people that are with you. Mititi es Midian Biyadom. That I should give Midian into their hands. You have way too many troops. Pen Yispoer Allah Yisro Leymar Yadi Hoshi Ali. Lest the Jewish people gl glorify themselves to me. And they will say, it is my hand that saved me. So the Malvam explains... Hashem wants to show everybody that He is doing a miracle over here. And if there be a lot of people in the battle, the people will think that they were the ones who created the victory. And again, because since the, the Jews still are idol worshippers, and they're not totally, you know, you just can't just flip-flop and instantly be the 100% connected to Hashem. So they'll see that they win the battle, and already they'll, they'll start making a mistake and thinking that we won the battle, which is not what Yerush Hashem is all about. And, they, and, you know, if you're going to say that at the end of the battle, what are you thinking when you're coming into the battle? It must be that uh, we must be able to do it ourselves, which is not the truth perspective, which is something that the non-Jews would, would be able to pick on as something to separate us from Hashem, and they would lose the battle. So Hashem says, there's no way we can go to battle with that. So I don't want that. We'll, we'll see it a little bit more. We'll, we'll have a contrast. Rafa Amasher Itoch. We'll see what that means. Pasuk Gimel. Va'ata now, Krona Ba'asneam, call out in the, name, in the ears of the people, just like the Kohen would make this announcement before the Jews went to any battle. Lamer saying, Mi Yorei, Vecharei, anyone who is afraid, Yashov, let him go back. The Yitzpor Mehar Hagilod. And let him yitzpor from Har Gilad. Now this is a very unusual word, vayitzpor. Um, so the Mephorshim say, in other words, let him get up early and leave so no one will see that he's left. In other words, he's not going to do it right now. Uh, again, what, what time of day are we at over here? So it says, it says by Yash came, he, he got up early. Rashi says Bavoker. What? Rashi says Bavoker, but you start Bavoker. Okay, fine. Yeah, from the word safra, safra, baboker, but but meaning early, early. So it could be, you know, in other words, you guys get up early and leave. You know, go out in a way that no one will know who left. Do it very quietly. Okay, so maybe maybe it's the next morning. Oh, it could be he he said it in the day, right? He has them all together, and now he says, whoever's really afraid, you know, tomorrow morning, just make sure you're out. And now he doesn't tell them to totally leave. He just says, to, what does he say? Mire, he says, the Yitzpor. Again, and one of the other Mephorshim on the word for Yitzpor, uh, 
it's like a tzipor, like to fly away. Uh, but 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 it, but it means to, to to leave this mountain. But he didn't tell them to go home. As you'll see, he tells to the other, the next tier that he releases. So it says, "Vayoshav minaam esri mushnaim elef." So how many people returned from the battlefield? Twenty-two thousand left the battlefield. Vaseres alafim nisharu, leaving ten thousand behind. Okay. So the Malbim explains. Well, there's, this is the first of a two-tier test system to weed down the troops. He starts with 32,000 troops. The first test reduces it down to 10,000 troops. We'll see another test coming in the next few him that reduces it down to 300 troops. So there were two threshold levels that cut down the troops. Now, you've got to be a real believer in God to do this, man. You know, you know Gidon, segment, he already isn't still so confident, right? And now some's taking it down from 32,000 to 300. That's 1% of the troops that you have. And believe me, at 32,000, they were probably quite outnumbered. So now I can imagine with 300. But the Malbim explains that there's two things. Hashem's bracha the, of the dew will not come down unless there's two things that are there. Number one, he calls hachanas hagvura. You need a, a, a courage, a real courage on the part of the people, number one. And number two, hachanas hakidusha. A person prepares himself to receive godly uh, benefits. Right? Because there were two aspects that had to happen. Number one, you have to have the courage to go down to battle and not, as they say, you know, you know shake in your boots. You've you got to have the courage to go down that mountain. I mean, ju just to go, you, and you see these awesome troops, you know, there are people who freeze. You just, you just, I can't help it. I, I, uh, you know, that's nothing to do with Hashem over here. You have to have the courage to go with your, with your sword right down into the valley, right into the, and they're going to shoot in their spears and everything, and, and to not, not be literally uh, terrified. <laughs> so that's number one that has to be there, and that's not up to Hashem, that's it. And then number two, you, you, Hashem makes a miracle and the divine spirit of Hashem comes down and helps it. And you are the miraculous vehicle of what Hashem is going to do. So now we've got to sift through two tiers over here. So number one, we've got to get rid of people who are afraid. If people are afraid, it's not going to help them. It's not going to be, be successful at all. Before we talk about deservant of a miracle, they themselves won't even be coming to, to battle. So that's what Yosha Vayit for. He says they should immediately go away and, and go back to the mountains of Gilad in the morning. But he didn't tell them to go home as he tells the next group. Because we will see as the battles continue, he's still going to use these troops. These 22,000 who leave, he's putting them at the, at the mountain, okay, you stay back, Desert. and when the battle will continue, and then these people are going to be running away, and then you see they're losing, then you're not so afraid. When you see the enemy is losing, then everybody becomes a lot more courageous. But when you're going down right into the heat of battle, we need the most uh, courageous people. So I don't want 22,000 guys going. That is the first sight of something going around. They, they turn around and run, and that, and that gets everybody scared. So you can't do that. So he says, a, a expression of yitzpor, that, so Malvim is one who says it, that they should like fly, shia ufu, mehar kitsiporim. Right? Uh, like enemies who fly away, uh, not like the next group, which we'll see what he does to them. So that's group number one. So we've got to get rid of, of that group. Now, moving on to the next test. So now he's down to 10,000 troops. Now, it's interesting, the numbers over here, why 22,000 left? So the Gomorrah Baba Kama says, what's special about number 22,000? What's special is the, the Gomorrah says, the minimum amount of people who must exist for the divine presence to descend upon us has to be 22,000 people. It's, it's got to be 22,000. In this Pesukim, they base it on Shuv Hashem, Rivavos, Alfe, Yisrael. So Rivavos is 20,000, Alfe is 2,000. It's got to be 22,000 people. To, to have the divine presence around. So Hashem Badafka wants 22,000 to leave. So, in other words, don't think you guys are so spiritually great that you even deserve the divine presence. I'm taking away Badafka that number away from you. All right? And we'll see in a minute, the next number that leaves is 10,000. That's what's left. 
And that, although, is a significant number, because we say that that's a five-digit number, and that's a significant number. And he's saying, I don't want that number either. In other words, all the things that you think, oh, it's a good sign, we've got this kind of number, get out of here, I don't want you to rely on anything. And that's a good place to stop. So we'll continue tomorrow at Pasig the second tier uh, of releasing people from the battle.